it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 89 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens, more chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Mocha. We love mocha. It's delicious. It's so good. So are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus all products ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. So how are you doing? I'm all right. And you're freshly returned from vacation. Freshly rejuvenated, relaxed, little, I don't like to say jet lagged, but. You almost need a day or two of vacation from your vacation yeah. before you get back into it. Well, especially with airline travel, when you're driving 40 minutes to the airport, mm-hmm. then we're on a five hour flight. Then after the five hour flight, then you have to drive two hours in the rental van mm-hmm. to get to the resort. So then coming back, you have to redo all of that. And you don't have all that excitement in you to get to vacation. Yeah, it's just a long way home. Yeah, you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, man, oh, man. But you got to come home to the chickies. Yeah, saw lots of feral chickens, Mm -hmm. lots and lots. So, yes, happy to be home to all my beloved furred and feathered babies. (laughs) Missed them so much. Yeah. How was your week? Oh, it was great. We did a ton of work around the farm, lots of stuff in the garden for fall. We also assembled our nest terra coop. Oh, I have to get on that. Yeah, more about that in an upcoming episode. But let me just say it exceeds my expectations in every good way possible. Good, because it's going to be an additional part in our new run that's being built. Right. So mm-hmm. soon that will be out there yeah. and our new run will be built. That's the thing I'm excited about being back for, mm-hmm. getting all the displaced chickens back oh, where yeah. they need to go. Yeah. We also really pushed the integration. We're about to do the full integration for our original batch of chicks this year. Mm -hmm. They've been out with the Brahmas. Oh, good. Yeah. So that's going very well. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I have what Joe calls the circus coop set up in the garage, basically. Yeah, it worked Big tops, temporary housing for all the babies until the new run is built. Mm -hmm. So we will be getting them out there as soon as possible. Perfect. I'm going to change subjects a little bit. And ask everybody a favor. If you are listening to our show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It helps us grow so, so much. Never miss a show. If you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can head over to Etsy. Check out the merchandise we have there. You can become a patron of the show. Visit us at patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out the levels of membership. One of them includes a monthly bonus episode. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our show notes, use our affiliate links, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me just take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you... You need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with the chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the June Box, I absolutely love the embroidered rooster apron and the egg carton stickers. I love those chicken leg bands with charms and the egg cartons that go with those stickers. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your purchase and shipping is always free. It's such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box with at least a three-month subscription. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. 
Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. La, 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 it's time for the Breed Spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. Breed Spotlight this week is? The Catalana. The Catalana. We're going to be talking to somebody in our main subject coming up later that's going to explain why we're doing this chicken today. But this chicken is a little chicken that needs some big help. Mm Mm-hmm. The Catalana is more formally known as the Catalana del Prat Leonada, Mm -hmm. or just the Prat. Related to Chris? No. Oh, that's different spelling and everything. That's a shame. It originates from Catalonia, Spain, near Barcelona. Okay. It is a dual-purpose breed, and it's one of the larger members of the Mediterranean class. Right. They were developed during the end of the 1800s, and it's probably from local country birds, Castilian chickens, and they were crossed with whatever Asiatics were at hand. Okay. It seems like the late 19th century, and this makes perfect sense, anytime someone wanted to beef up a breed, they went right for the Asiatics. Because they're big. Langshan Brahma Cochin, right? Yep. They are currently listed as critically endangered on the Livestock Conservancy's poultry conservation list. Basically, number one critically endangered. Yeah, if they're Biggest. not one, they're definitely like the top three. They're, yeah. yeah. The Catalana was exhibited for the first time at the 1902 World's Fair in Madrid. Okay. They've been more popular in Spain and Latin America than here in the U.S., But they were reasonably popular here during the mid-20th century, and they were accepted into the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1949. Sounds good. They're a true mid-century chicken. They are. I cannot say it enough. We need to help this chicken, though. It's in real, real big trouble here, and we need to help it. Yeah, and the thing about them is that they're kind of awesome chickens, and they're good at several things. Yeah. They're very robust and healthy. They're good layers that don't go broody. They remind me of an Orpington, a buff Orpington kind of. The color-wise, right, right. Yeah, they're buff. Mm -hmm. They're cute little chickens. They are. They're good foragers. They're very active, and they are great for turning over garden beds. Well, they're Mediterranean. They're going to be. Exactly. And because they're Mediterranean, they are extremely heat-hardy. Yeah, that'd be a great chicken for southern U.S., someplace in the U.S. where it's always warm. Mm -hmm. They will need some protection from cold and frostbite because they have those big combs yeah. in the far northern climates. But with most of the world currently under a heat wave, yeah. they sound like an excellent choice for a homestead or a backyard flock. Oh, it has been extremely hot. So you want a chicken that can take these temperatures in the summer. I mean, we didn't even really have a spring. We went from winter to summer. Right. That happens more and more now. Yeah, it does. You're either going to freeze yourself, silly, or hot, hot, hot. Mm -hmm. And you need a bird to fit into one of these two categories, whatever you have the most. Yeah. And a lot of the U.S. has a lot of heat. Absolutely. While I was researching the Catalana, I stumbled across a copy of the USDA's first agricultural vocabulary book. It was published in 1967. Of course you did. Of course I did. It's, this is just a little bit of a history geek out, but I thought it was interesting. The book is the USDA's attempt to standardize names and terms to make agricultural education easier. Unfortunately, what this did in a lot of cases was it removed the breed's original name and along with it, more information about the breed and their indigenous roots. For example, the Catalana del Prat Leonida was included. The USDA suggested that they simply be called buff Catalanas. Okay. What you lose there is the information that this bird came specifically from El Prat, which is a farming community outside of Barcelona. Yeah, which helps when you're going back and trying to do research and figure out. It does. But you found it, so we know it. (laughs) I found it, right. Other people have found it. And I get what the USD was trying to do. You have a goat with three different names. How do you know you're all talking about the same one? Right. But it's one of those things that if you're trying to research the origins of a heritage breed, the rest of the name can be important. It's geographical. It's in their name usually. Right, right. So in most of the world, the Catalana only comes in one color. Buff. Right. But there is also a white version in Spain. Okay. One of the features of the Catalana is something that I think is so beautiful. My buff nankins, they have slate blue legs, Mm -hmm. which I think looks gorgeous against the buff. Yeah. They also have white ear lobes. Mediterranean. Right. I mean, they're going to lay some white eggs because they have white ear lobes. That high Mediterranean tail. And then they have very dark eyes. The roosters are very handsome. They have tall, straight combs, long waddles, and really gorgeous black-green iridescent tails. They are definitely handsome boys. 
The hens have the usual flop over comb that you see on all the other Mediterranean hens, but the ends of the Catalana's tail feathers are black. Yeah, it's a lot of chickens you notice have that little underlying blackness in the back yeah. of their tails, depending upon their breed. Right. But it is cute. It does kind of set them apart. Mm -hmm. you, you know differently at that point. You're not looking at a big old buff warpington. You're looking right. at a Catalana. Also, they're lighter, so you can tell. But the black feathers are really noticeable on the ends of the tail. It sets off the buff even more. It does. And I notice on Spicy, my Rhode Island Red, that she has the black under feathers on her tail, too, mm -hmm. which is so cool. Yeah. Now, this breed is a little bigger than most of the Mediterraneans. It does look bigger. I think the only breed bigger than them is the Ancona. Okay. The breed standard calls for roosters to weigh about eight pounds and hens about six pounds. Now, that's the breed standard. That's big for a Mediterranean. Very it is. Big. However, that's the standard. The reality is that these birds are so scarce that I couldn't find enough information to come up with an average weight on them. So yeah. I just had to go with the ideal weight from the standard of perfection. Yeah. I mean, six pounds, some Orpingtons are six pounds. Oh, that's my Swedish flower. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's not little for Mediterranean. No, that's, that's a, large. That's yeah. a good-sized bird. Yeah. yeah I sure. mean, they're a dual-purpose bird. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously stayed in their DNA. So like we said before, they're going to lay white or lightly tinted cream eggs. And they're going to give you about 180 to 200 a year, which isn't great for Mediterranean, but isn't bad either. Still about four a week. Yeah. They're often described as flighty. But one of the few actual breeders I found said that she doesn't think her Catalanas are flighty. She just considers them active and curious. Yeah, I think that's a better way to say flighty. You mm -hmm. know, active, curious, stand guard. They're going to want to protect themselves. Good instincts. And you're going to have to work with them. Yeah. And yeah. that's isn't that the glory of having these chickens is to work with them and handle. not just put them down and, yeah, and to handle mm -hmm. them and to love them and not just to put them down in the grass and say, oh, they're flighty. Since this is a bird that needs conservation help, I feel like the sight of a whole flock of these is probably absolutely gorgeous. Oh, I'm sure. So where can you get them? Not a lot of places. I know. You can check the Livestock Conservancy's breeder directory. Right. See if you can find anyone there. Your best bet, now this is straight run in lots of, I think, 15 or 20. Right. Your best bet is Sand Hill Preservation Center. Okay. They have been working with this breed for several years, and they do have nice breeding stock. If you're lucky, you can Google a private breeder in your zip code, see if there's someone And this close chicken by. needs so much assistance. The numbers are staggering how low they are. So you're not going to be able to get just a hen. Anytime you get them, you're going to be getting probably a boys and Probably. Girls, so mean, that you can help this breed grow back. Exactly. Unless you get lucky and find a breeder with the Livestock Conservancy who has hens to place that are maybe mm -hmm. good quality layers, but not right. up to the standard. Right. You might get lucky that way. Otherwise, yeah, it's probably just going to be breeding stock. Yeah. If you have the Catalana, send us some pictures. Tell us about it. We would love to know. We'll give you a story on Instagram. One cute little bird needs our help here in the U.S. Please, if you'd like to look them up on Google and see if they're a bird you would like, do that. And they're named Catalana. How can you not want that? No, it's cute. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosty's store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, water or nipple, and water or cup kits. And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosty's range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so it's time to move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. This week's main topic, we are talking poultry census with Dr. Jeanette Berenger. Dr. Berenger is a senior program manager with the Livestock Conservancy. She's a former zookeeper. In fact, she is the first female head zookeeper of the Roger Williams Zoo in Providence, Rhode Island. She's told us lots of awesome stories about when she did this. And she is a longtime breeder of the Crevcore chicken. Which has moved up in the stakes, so gone in a good direction right, right. in the census this year, which is really good. Yeah. So for anyone who isn't a regular listener or who's a new listener, the Livestock Conservancy is one of our favorite organizations. They're a nonprofit that works to protect endangered breeds of livestock and poultry from extinction. Mm -hmm. This is why we're talking so much about the Catalana right now. Right. The poultry census is conducted by the Livestock Conservancy every five years or so. Yeah, she was saying before, like, she had done a 10-year span, mm -hmm. and now they're really trying with technology to get it going every five right. years. It measures the number of breeding heritage stock poultry in the U.S. So when you fill out the survey, if you just have, say, backyard hens or pet Doesn't room, matter. Right. You're only going to list it if they're actual breeding stock. And this year's census was entirely sponsored 
by our friends at Murray McMurray Hatchery. Yes. So a gigantic thank you to them. Doing some great stuff for the poultry community out there. So let's go talk to Jeanette. Enjoy. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Jeanette. Thanks for having me again. Of course. Oh, you're one of our favorite guests. You have <laughs> the best stories. I got a million of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to talk to you today about the 2021 to 2022 poultry census. You've wrapped it mm-hmm. up now. Yeah. So just to kind of give you a background on it, censusing is one of the more important things we do because it kind of gives us a snapshot of how the breeds are doing. And poultry censusing in particular is very challenging because there is no registry for poultry per se. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to do a lot of outreach to individuals to get an idea of what's going on. So that takes a lot of time. Uh, A lot of emailing, phone calling, posting on social media. And you also, for our work, we're interested in the people that are actually breeding the animals. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to be counting 50 Australorps that are coming from a hatchery that are all going to be butchered or something like that, or somebody's pet chicken that's never going to be bred. We're looking for people that are thoughtfully breeding their animals and contributing to the population. So we've targeted very specific audiences for that, primarily through the APA and through the breed clubs and not Hobby Farms Magazine, because that's where you're going to get a lot of the birds that are pet chickens kind of thing. But we reached out to a lot of people and we got data in over 7,500 flocks. Nice. And yeah, so I think it gave us a good chunk of the information we wanted to get. The other thing is looking at what kind of data we want, and we change things around a bit. And rather than just counting numbers of birds within the breed, we also counted birds within color varieties. Prior to like the 2015 census, we just couldn't do that because the technology wasn't there for us to break down the flocks into color varieties. Now it's possible, and so we did it. The other thing we did is we wanted to look at flock sizes and capture that. And so we tweaked the survey in a way that we could see what the average flock sizes were. So did you have between one and five or six and 10 or 20 to 30 or what have you? Because we wanted to see how many people out there had considerable size on their flocks. So it was a lot of data that we got in and it took a good full year. And I went through two coordinators uh, (laughs) because my first one ended up buying a farm that she found out after the fact has no access to Internet. (laughs) Oh, man, uh, that's off the grid for sure. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And then Norma Padgett came through at the last minute and helped me finish it up. She and her husband are longtime APA members, and Norma and Danny are very well thought of figures within the poultry community. So it was great for her to be saying, hey, you need to fill out this census. So we were able to collect a lot of great data. And, you know, there are some takeaways. I'm still trying to tell the story that this census lays out. And it's complex because you're talking about flock numbers, color varieties, you know, numbers of birds. And so there were a few takeaways that I can say for sure. We've seen a good number of breeds that have certainly declined since 2015. And a whole bunch of them move from threatened or watched to critical this go round. And That's what we um, noticed. Yeah. So that includes the ACL, the Buttercup, the Catalana, Cubalea. Hudan, Java, Seabright, and Shamo. And no real surprises there. You know, if you go to the shows, you're not seeing a lot of those birds. And if you keep your ear to the ground, you can hear that there are certain things that you just don't see them as often. And a lot of breeds were moved. And I hate to see that. But the whole purpose of doing this kind of thing is to raise red flags if there are any. So now we've got the flags raised and we have to do something about it. We're trying to do that with the Breed Spotlight every week. Bring awareness yeah. to breeds that people might not even know. We have taken a strong liking for the Java. We took a trip to the National Colonial <laughs> Farm and they're trying to get Java eggs. They did get some. They, yeah, they, they were getting get hatching eggs mm-hmm. for that farm. Yeah. 
some of these chickens, they just need awareness. Where can I get them? Where can I help? So Yeah, and that's where the, the conservancy comes in is we've got a list of people that have the birds or if they're not on the list, but they happen to participate in the survey, I can reach out to them and ask, hey, can I connect you with this person looking for eggs? Because I don't want to publish people's information if they don't want it published. Right. So there may be people out there with them. But Java, yeah, that's an important one because it's an old American breed. And if exactly. we're not conserving them here, it ain't being done elsewhere. My understanding is the major breeder up in Chicago is no longer hatching Java's. So oh, that's oh been boy. a big hit to that community. Someone's looking for a good conservation project. Black Javas or model Javas would be the way to go. There are people that are messing around with the whites and the auburns, but as far as APA standard birds, black and modeled are the only two there that is. are, yeah. You mentioned color variety, and we did notice in this year's poultry conservation list that the Rhode Island white has its own presence there. Is that mm -hmm. something that came out of this poultry census? Well, the Rhode Island white is a separate breed from the Rhode Island mm -hmm. red. So they're not considered a color variety. Okay, um, separate breed. Yeah, they're a separate breed. One of my favorites, I kept Rhode Island whites for a long time. They're great oh, birds. Oh, nice. The history, like I'm from Rhode Island, and there's this really fancy hotel in downtown Providence called the Biltmore. And back in the day, they actually had a flock of Rhode Island whites on the roof of the hotel that provided nice. eggs and occasionally fresh meat for the hotel guests. Oh, that's and I got, cool. I got this great newspaper clipping from back then talking about the flock. And it's pretty interesting to imagine the Biltmore with chickens on the roof. That's uh, pretty cool. That, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Is there any connection between the fact that so many of the birds that end up in the critical list are white egg layers? Yeah, it's because people have it in their heads that brown eggs are fresher or better or taste better. And that's absolutely not the case. Right. Exactly. You know, it's just eggs, creative eggs, marketing. Yeah. I think white eggs declined because they show dirt better. So you've got yeah. to clean them a little bit extra. Then you can pay $10 a dozen for blue eggs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they taste just the same. They're, They're exactly all the, the same, same thing. Yeah. So were there any good news stories on the census that you can report to us? A big leap for me personally is the Crev Corps. The Crev yeah. Corps moved from awesome. critical to threatened. And that's taken about nine years worth of work to get people wow. excited about them and breeding. And yeah, we found over 800 breeding birds. And when I first got started with them, if there was 100, we were lucky, really on the brink. So I'm really excited about that. And the other one is the cotton patch goose. They went from critical to threatened. And wow. I, I think that's also largely because of the active group on Facebook. And they're mm -hmm. talking about the geese and being excited about the geese and figuring out how to breed them because they're a bit more challenging than other goose breeds in that they can be aggressive with people and with each other. So people are figuring it out. We just gave this micro grant to a, a breeder that created goose tractors. And for the first time, she's having zero mortality in goslings because nice. she's able to separate the geese so that the pairs have their own spaces and they don't kill each other's birds or trample the goslings because they're running after a competitor. Yeah, so Cotton Patch was a really feel-good story. Another interesting thing is on the advice of David Anderson, who was a former president of APA, he suggested that we take a look at some of the bantams that are old and don't have a large fowl counterpart like um, we have with the Seabrights and the Nankins. And he thought that they were seeing decline. And so some of those that we're looking at that we're actually bringing into study so that we can do a little more research and get a better sense, should they be on the CPL or not? The Belgian bearded dukla and the booted bantam and the Japanese bantam. 
Japanese Bantam surprised me. I thought there were a lot out there. I did too. Yeah, because um, they do seem to be popular more on social media. Especially with showing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the numbers of breeders that responded and the Japanese Bantam Facebook page, I put info out there to please participate. So they're going to be in study and we'll see where that goes. But these are all old Bantam breeds with a long history in the U.S., when we looked at color varieties, there are some color varieties that we may have lost within certain populations. The buff Cornish, I think we may have lost. Oh, and the white Houdan, although I think you could probably get a white as a sport, possibly, okay. but nobody's working with white Houdans that I know of. And wheat and Japanese bantams, nobody seems to be working with them. Oh, so that may be gone, too. But, you know, we look at the loss of color varieties and this is where the color geneticists come in. And I'm like, hey, can you recreate this color variety from what we have left? And many of the circumstances, yeah, you can with the sport. So that's not as high a priority as, say, something like maybe the buff Cornish you can't recreate. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a color geneticist, so that's part of the work that I'm doing right now to write up this census and make sense of it. Do you see social media helping with the census, getting the information and knowing a little bit more about what's out there than in years in the past? Well, I think so. I will put the blame directly on social media for the Crevcore doing as well as it has. I can tell you, nobody was talking about them before we started our project. And, you know, just simple posts telling the good, the bad, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And I think the same things happened with the Cotton Patch Geese. They've got really strong Facebook page no nastiness, just telling it like it is. And here's what I'm doing with my geese and people learn from each other. And that works. People respond to that. But that means you've got to monitor social media big time so that the cattiness yeah. doesn't come out. That ruins everything. A lot of the poultry sites that I'm on are pretty strict about we're talking about the breed. If you've got an agenda, you're out and just try to learn from each other. But I think it's the social media outlets where you post stuff regularly because if you only do it like once a month or so, people lose interest. Posting all kinds of stuff. People love history stuff. They love cooking stuff. Definitely being active on social media and posting things that are useful and interesting to people, not just, hey, this is my pet dog and isn't he cute? <laughs> you know, you want to do more than that. Personally yeah. speaking, I started my Nankin flock simply because the Nankin breeders groups are fairly active and friendly. Mm -hmm. And I was able to find a local breeder. We, we drove to New Jersey yeah. to get yeah. flock starters and eggs. And it was very doable, but I never would have found her without that Facebook group. And I think it's so important. Yeah. Sometimes technology helps us. It can. It, it really helps us bridge yeah. that gap between people. But like you said, we have to be kind to one another and take <laughs> yeah. out that cattiness yeah. and whatever, all for the greater cause of saving these breeds. It hurts my heart when I hear you say, this one is no longer. How many years in the making was that variety? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that the Crevcore and the Cotton Patch are on the right path. Breeds are going to come and go. So that's why we do these census efforts so that we can just make sure things are moving along okay, because it's really easy for a breed to slip back. With the turkeys, we found that the slate turkey slipped and they moved from watch, which they were very comfortable in to threaten because there's just not a lot of people breeding them. You know, it's a challenging color variety. And if you want to yeah. show them, they're not easy to perfect that color, but they're beautiful, beautiful birds. But they're big. They take a lot of resources and you've got to hatch and grow a lot to get the few that are going to make the cut as breeders. What can the average person do besides getting their own breeding flock to help the cause? Well, buy from breeders. Certainly, if you take in the step and you get your hatchery birds and you kind of like a certain breed, and then you go to a serious breeder then. I understand, though, you're not going to get those birds at hatchery prices. You're buying the years of work that's been put into perfecting that bird, but it's also saving you all those years of work. Yeah. If you even know what you're doing, I was looking for just non-show Seabrights, and I called up one gentleman that I know has some very fine Seabrights. 
five hundred dollars a bird. It's like, oh my wow. god, <laughs> they have arrived. <laughs> yeah, but those birds are show winners, and he's been working with them since the nineteen sixties. So they're very good Seabrights, but mm -hmm. I only needed something to pack up to take to festivals with me. So <laughs> yeah. right. my husband was not going to appreciate me spending a thousand bucks. on <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, my youngest daughter is way into Seabrights. We do not have any bantams here at our farm, but she wants Seabrights in the worst way. In she the really worst does. way. That might be something yeah. that we try down the road, but I really am interested in the job of I really think such a strong chicken, the second chicken of America, shouldn't mm -hmm. fall through our cracks. I mean, we all have to work together. Well, yeah, Javas are going to be on our list for next year, no doubt. We have listeners across the board. We have people who show chickens. We have people who don't even have chickens yet. If you were a new chicken person, and let's say you're not particularly experienced with animals, what chicken breeds on the conservation list might you recommend to someone who wants to start with a heritage breed? Well, certainly stuff like the Rhode Island Red or Javas are easy keepers, too. They're just mm -hmm. hard to find. Dominiques are really easy. Yeah. Uh, they're kind of like a do-it-all chicken. There are any number of birds. What I would say is some of the challenging ones, like the Asiatics, might not be a good pick because they can be aggressive with each other and sometimes with people. I think you need a little more experience under your belt. Say so you want to get into Azeals and Shamos. But if you've got some experience, in particular, the melee, they're in a lot of trouble. People are crossing them up and making all kinds of stuff. But the mm. pure melee is really hurting. And this is a breed that we call it a foundational breed, where mm -hmm. a lot of things were created with it. And it's yes. an ancient breed. But to breed them properly, you got to have a little experience under your belt and know what you're getting into. Yeah. But that's certainly a noteworthy breed to consider. Another one that I think is really deserving of attention, well, I mean, they all are, but the Catalana, that's another one where the numbers have just crashed. And they're beautiful birds. They're productive. If you look at some of the old poultry journals, we've got a bunch from like the early 1900s, late 1800s. Catalana was one of the top layers in America for a mm -hmm. long time, and they've just disappeared. And they're magnificent to look we at. We can do our know? part in Breed Spotlight on that, for actually, sure. Actually, we can do the Catalana and the Breed Spotlight for this episode. They're in the Mediterranean class, and they're very heat hardy, so they'd be very appropriate yes. for people in the South. Yeah, think of like a buff-colored Menorca. They're not quite as big as Menorcas, but mm -hmm. they've got magnificent crests. They've got huge combs. And I've always thought the roosters were gorgeous. As a breeder of poultry, I've never bred buff colored birds, but to perfect that color is a pain in the patoot. And I think that's part of the reason they've not taken off. People that work with buff birds, you've got to appreciate their fortitude because buff is just a really hard color to perfect. I, the nankins are essentially buff, especially the pens. Mm -hmm. And I never appreciated how many different color feathers could be in a buff bird until I hatched mm -hmm. my first litter of nankins. And we work with Fiona yeah. over in England, who is a buff Warfington, Warfington breeder, breeder, and her yeah. birds are absolutely gorgeous. And she puts so much yeah. into That's them. Like 10 years of breeding. Yeah. yeah. So, like, like you said, you do have to appreciate, I mean, yeah. to get more people into it for the conservation efforts, get excited, get inspired, help save a breed of animal. You're doing so much work traveling the country, educating and getting mm -hmm. everybody aware of this. Thank you, Jeanette, for doing this, because without somebody oh. like you, we would not be aware of what's going on. Well, thanks. We've also been working on a joint project with APA in documenting master breeders to pick their brain about their breed and some of the things to look out for as a breeder. Thinking of a buffs, I interviewed Lou Horton, who's very well known for his buff wine dot bantams. And he's been at them a while. And he's the one where I, I didn't have a full appreciation of just how hard buff is <laughs> until I talk with Lou. I've also just finished a video on Rhode Island Reds. And they're both on the APA website. And it's called Secrets of the Masters. 
And oh. I've got a whole bunch of interviews that I've worked on with them. And it's just trying to pick their brain on the finer points of working with that particular breed that maybe isn't written down anywhere, but it's in their yeah. heads. So we're trying to pull that out and document it. And I've learned so much. I know enough about poultry to be dangerous, but then you go talking to these guys and you're like, I know nothing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Speaking of the melee, the Rhode Island Red would not be here without the melee. Correct. It was one of the foundation that is breeds correct. the Rhode Island Red. And it Michael is. And the Brahmas as well. Yeah. If the average person is like, okay, can I go to the Livestock Conservancy? Can I join? What do we have to do to do this? There are a number of different levels. I do like $5 a month and that keeps my membership current and I don't have to think about it. And it gives them a little extra money at the end of the year beyond my membership. And then we have other levels like life membership, but a majority of the money goes towards the work. We're not here for the money, that's for sure, <laughs> working at the conservancy, but we've got some really effective programs that work. We're a nonprofit and we've been going since 1977 and we haven't lost a breed yet. That's you know, amazing. So I can't say that for color varieties for chickens, but if the primary breed's still there, then we're still good. But yeah, we encourage people to be members. We have a quarterly newsletter and we do a lot of Facebook lives that focus in on specific breeds. They or great. My favorite's Wooly Wednesday. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> of course. I'm a sheep girl from way yeah, back. But yeah. so I love the Wooly Wednesdays. But you also do the chicken chats and you do the horse talks. And yeah, every month is really a different great. species. Right now it's horse month, and then August will be duck month. Every month is a different species. And then the month of May is when we celebrate our anniversary and International Heritage Breeds Month. So we talk about what other people are doing around the world with their breeds. Because, you know, every country has native breeds and they're most likely rare. And, and so it's neat to see what's going on. We're members. We have some wonderful listeners who have joined the Conservancy and have told us. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm thinking of one in particular, Sarah. And one of the breeds Sarah got is one of the breeds we want to talk to you about. One of our favorites uh -huh. is the white face Black Spanish. How yes. are they doing? They seem to be doing okay. They have not moved in any of the categories. We found a total of 27 breeding flocks and an estimated population of 282 birds. They're still pretty rare. They haven't yeah. really moved. That's for yeah, sure. Because they've been in critical. So I need yeah. them. I don't have them. I don't need them. When I got married, our save the date card was a pair of white faced black Spanish chickens. <laughs> I love them so much, but we've never found them locally. We're going to have to make a pilgrimage to find some. That brings me to if you join, you get access to the directory through the Livestock Conservancy of the list of people who breed these chickens. You can see the online directory. You don't have to be a member, but you do have to be a member to post in there and have your farm listed. But if you're looking to find those particular animals, our website has a marketplace uh, online breeders and products directory, so you can find stuff there. The other thing is a lot of our people can only afford one organization or another. Mm -hmm. And so we offer for $10 a year, you can list your farm in the online directory. And that's the best bit of advertising you'll oh, ever yes. pay for. Yeah. yeah so for that's, sure. Um, Ridiculously reasonable. Yeah. So there are different ways you can get on there. and Let us help promote your breed. That's fantastic. So what are the breeds that you think are in the most trouble? The Azeal estimated population, about 100. Buttercups, just under 300. Campine, just under 400. Catalana, 46. Oh, <laughs> no. If you can help this bird. I'm astonished. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Cubalea is under 300. The Holland actually did better than I thought. They were around 450. Houdan is just under 300. Java, we found about 300 of them. Well, that's better um, than La I thought. Me too. La Flèche is about 150. Melee, we only found 134. Red caps, 136. And that we can thank McMurray Hatchery and Ginger over there. there. There's a breeder in Texas that yeah. got their stock from. 
Yeah, right. and uh, I think Mick Murray's work and, and actually Greenfire imported some eggs last year. They didn't get many to hatch, but they've got some English blood that's come in. Right. So how they use it will be exciting. Yeah. Sultans are under 400. White paste black Spanish, as I said, just under 300. And Yokohama is up around 200. Mostly red shouldered and only four flocks had the white Yokohamas. Oh, I wish there was more availability across the board through mm. different hatcheries, through bigger farm supply stores, so people could actually get them. They're rare. So, you, you know, when I first got my CREP course, I had to source them from St. Louis. And I live in North Carolina, so that's a right. long ways away. But yeah. if that's really what I want, you make it happen. Otherwise, pick something that's more local. But the worst thing you can do is get something really rare, get in and get out. Most people last seven years and that's it. And then disperse their animals. And that's one of the worst things you can do because unless you thoughtfully disperse them, folks want to get the rarest of the rare. So if you're really not going to commit to it, don't pick the rarest of the rare. And if you do get rare birds, please make sure the hawks aren't going to get them or the foxes. I can't tell you how many times people are like, oh, yeah, the fox got in. It's like my birds are in Fort Knox. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I've got hot wire. I've got wire on the top. I've got buried wire. I've got telephone poles. I mean, they are in Fort Knox. And yeah. I think of the worst possible predator, like maybe a little Jack Russell Terrier getting into my chicken coops. Mm. Where would that dog dig? I rarely ever have lost anything to a predator only once. And I figured out what it was and took care of it. But if you've got rare birds, treat them like that, you know, because mm -hmm. they're not easy to replace. So any notable success stories this time around? Well, as I said, the craft core and the cotton patch. cotton patch. Yeah, they've really gained popularity and seem to be doing okay. Is there so, anyone who has moved into recovering that wasn't there before? Favorals. Favorals are moving from threatened to watch. Yes. <laughs> that is one of our yeah. And I do have four of them. Yeah, the vast, vast majority are salmon favorals. There were 130 flocks of salmons, but only four flocks of white favorals. Oh, wow. Whites are not in great shape, but that color variety could be recovered from the salmon. So I think the moral of this story is if you can help, if you have a passion <laughs> for chickens, and you'd like to breed, pick a breed out of the ones that you've listed that need critical attention and make it your passion. The other thing I would say is get over this fear of having white eggs. Yeah, like surely. One of the things that makes yeah. your, your green and blue eggs stand out so much is putting them next to white eggs. Yeah. That's what I always yeah. think. Yeah. You know, the thing is an egg is an egg is an egg. It, it you is. know, <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> they all taste the same. It's unfair that that happens, but I remember as a kid, the local egg board saying brown eggs are local eggs and they're fresh. And it was a catchy jingle, but it's just a marketing tool is all. Mm -hmm. and, kind but of like when we looked into the cholesterol in eggs and everybody back then saying, don't eat eggs because they're high in cholesterol. All propaganda through media. Oh, yeah. And it'll change a couple of years from now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's what it does. But if you think about it, an egg, and I've heard my good friend Pat Foreman say many, many times that, you know, an egg has everything you need to create life. And so as a, a food resource, it's tough to beat an egg. Pardon the pun. <laughs> but, uh, <it's, laughs> I like that. So, yeah, get over it. It's just color. Occasionally, this question comes up. Why heritage breeds? Some of them will say, why are heritage breeds so important? If they were so great, why did they go in decline? We explain pretty much every week the history of why they go into decline. Uh -huh. But what's so important about them? What do they do for biodiversity? Well, that's the point is biodiversity and that these animals represent genes that many times may not be found in commercial stock. We're doing a DNA study right now with heritage chickens and are finding some gene variants within the heritage chicken populations in the area of the DNA that's their immune function. And there are gene variants within their immune function that are completely non-existent in commercial birds. Wow. So they obviously have something associated with their immune systems that commercial birds don't have. 
what if it's a disease resistance or parasite resistance or just a, a robust immune system in general? What we can say is it's non-existent in commercial birds. Right. So we think that's pretty important to keep around. We don't know exactly what it is, but what we do know is if they go away, so do their genes. And the other thing is with the way climate is changing, and these are the animals that are going to be more adaptable and able to handle the weather extremes that we're seeing. You know, I talked with Frank Reese once about his turkeys, and he had a big tornado blow through, and the turkeys just knew how to hunker down in the corn, and he didn't lose any. And mothering skills don't expect commercial birds to be raising their own young. So there are some basic things that these animals are still capable of doing that our commercial birds can't do. And I'm, I'm not bashing the commercial birds. It's just they're designed for one thing and one mm -hmm. thing only, which mm -hmm. is to grow fast on as little feed as possible. And, and lay these as many birds, eggs as they can in yeah. the first two years and that's it. Yeah. So these birds are different and you do have to get it in your head that it's comparing apples and oranges. They are not going to grow fast no matter what you do. And if you're thinking about having a meat business with heritage breeds, well, think again, because you're going to have to sell those birds for a lot of money to make your money back when grains like 20 bucks a bag now or 22 bucks a bag. It's and crazy. Then you've got a slow growing animal on top of that. You know, you really have to crunch the numbers, but they're a great addition as supplemental income, especially if you're breeding them well enough that they meet APA standard, because then you can start selling hatching eggs for like 10, 20 bucks a dozen. You know, I have a friend who's got really good leg earned chickens. And if you're not willing to spend 50 bucks a dozen, you ain't getting any. I don't think that's that I don't much. think that's expensive and either. <laughs> we, we have this conversation many times. Farmers and breeders should absolutely be charging more for their birds, yeah. given the pet quality. The hatcheries should be charging more for their birds. A chicken taken care of properly can feed you for her lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. But people are used to cheap food. A chicken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A good friend of mine once said, people forget there are two definitions of the word cheap. One is inexpensive and the other is crappy. So That's true. You just so got to keep that in mind and understand you're paying them a higher price because you're paying for the work that person put into that yes. breed if they're on the up and up. Buyer beware, make sure that you research who you're buying your birds from and ask, are they NPIP tested? If they're not, eh, next, do they make APA standard? Well, no, eh, next. So educate yourself on what you're buying. And the other thing I wanted to mention that I didn't touch upon was flock sizes. Of the 7,500 flocks we surveyed, only 122 of them are more than 50 birds. Wow. That's something that is good and bad to do really well with a breed. You've got to hatch a lot of birds. Yeah, and yeah. so with small flock size, it's going to take you longer to get to a level of excellence. And that was somewhat alarming that there's not that many big flocks out there. But, you know, it's not a surprise. Feed is just so ridiculously expensive that who the heck can afford to feed 50 to 100 birds? It's gone up a lot. Astonishing. I, I mean, for the average backyard farmer, it's really crazy how much the feed has gone up. Yeah. You keep tweaking your system and figuring out, you know, where are your losses. I saved one third of my feed bill by wetting my food down. So yep. the birds eat it like candy. There's no waste of food. And my food bill was cut by a third. Yeah, and, we both do mesh you know, as well. Yeah. yeah. And they eat it like candy. So they love it. it's <laughs> they pain think in the butt. Different is not. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's a pain in the butt to wet it down and then clean everything every day, yeah. but definitely has improved growth rates. It's improved size on my birds and, and loss of feed. You got to look at things like that to see where are your holes in your system and how can you improve it. Another one was shavings. I went from flake shavings to ultra fine shavings. And I went from having to clean my coop every week to like every three weeks with spot cleaning because it's so absorbent mm -hmm. and the extra fine shavings, you can pick through them more easily. 
and it composts really, really fast, but that's dropped my shavings bill by two thirds, really. So look at those kind of things to try and understand where your heavy burdens are for cost. And that can go a long way for you. I guess the other takeaway is that you might feel like you have this little flock of 25 birds and you're not making a difference. But with numbers like this, you You are are making a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying a small flock can't do something substantial. It'll take longer. It'll take longer, (laughs) right. If we can get more people with smaller flocks, it can help. Like say somebody can only do 25 chickens, but then they tell their neighbor, their neighbor's like, yeah, I think it's really cool. I'm going to do this. And the power of people, you get more people, Mm -hmm. smaller flocks. Yeah. you, You can get the same. Yep. Thank you, so. Jeanette, for all of your work you do. It's amazing. Without you doing this out there, we would lose a lot of breeds. Thank you for coming on the show and taking the time with us and educating everyone that's listening about the census and how important it is for the chickens in the U.S. Oh, and you're welcome. Thanks for having me. You can come on anytime, anytime you'd like. Till next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. We just want to say thank you one more time to Dr. Jeanette Berenger for coming on the show. She's really one of our favorite people to interview. So much fun. Yeah. And there's a lot of food for thought in the results of that census. Yeah. Some of it is Mm -hmm. really sad. Mm -hmm. So take a look. If you're on the cusp of wanting to help a heritage breed come back in, one or two breeding hens and roos, maybe you can help. You helped with the nankins. (laughs) With my nine (laughs) nankins. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You moved them out of that category. (laughs) Okay. So now it's about that time for... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. And today we're doing creme brulee because that's one of Jeanette's and her husband's favorite recipes. Mm -hmm. Creme brulee looks and sounds very fancy. There are a lot of little steps to it, but it's actually easy to make. And it uses four egg yolks. So you have four egg whites to make meringues with or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. It's I, easy to find something to use those You probably white, just cook up for. your egg whites and feed them to your chickens if you want to. Or you can just do an egg white omelet. Yeah. Sometimes I just like... Oh, no, I want some yolk I know you always like the yolk, <laughs> but I sometimes just do, even especially when I'm traveling, I do an egg white omelet. Okay. And I pack it full of veggies. So like almost every other dessert out there, creme brulee starts with a custard. And every good dessert starts with a custard. Yeah, right, say right. So if you can have dairy, you're going to start with two cups of heavy cream. If, like me, you cannot, there are a couple of really good dairy-free half-and-half products on the market, and they work really well. Now, this is a good one for the DiCarlo household because it's 10 tablespoons of sugar. Yeah. Somewhere in this recipe, and it's divided, so you're going to use it multiple spots, but that's 10 tablespoons. Right. The DiCarlo house is like, yes, when it comes to sugar. Right. So we've got our cream. We've got your sugar. (laughs) Yeah, we got my sugar in there. We have vanilla extract, four egg yolks, and a pinch of salt. Those are all your ingredients. Yeah. That's it. It just goes to show you how good eggs can be Mm -hmm. with a little bit of sugar and vanilla. Well, you're going to use even more sugar because it's going to go on top of the (laughs) brulee. Exactly. So preheat your oven to 325. And then you want a baking dish. You want Mm -hmm. to put your ramekins in a baking dish because, again, like a lot of custard desserts, Mm -hmm. you want to bake it in a water bath. Yeah. If you've never done that before, it's really simple. It is so simple. You just put them in there and put the water in until they come about halfway up. And then that is it. It promotes slow and even cooking throughout. And that way, if one has a little bit less, it's not going to matter. Yeah. It makes a dense and smooth texture. It's really nice. So you're going to make your custard in a saucepan the usual. You're going to heat that until it begins to simmer. Then you're going to separate your eggs. Mm -hmm. You want your yolks in a bowl and whatever you want to do with the whites. Then you're going to take more of the sugar. You're going to whisk that into the yolks. So you have your warm custard, you have your yolks and sugar whisked together, and then it's time to temper your eggs. We've talked about this many, many times. It's just slowly adding the hot liquid to the eggs until it gets to a good temperature. Right. And then you can add it all together. At this point, you can strain it if you got any lumps from your eggs. That's sometimes if you did the tempering too quickly, yeah, you'll you, get lumps. You get some lumps. So that's the importance of that. Mm-hmm. But like you said, you can just strain them out. Yeah, it's easy. Feed them to the dog. And then at that point, you decide whether you want to refrigerate your base for later use or you want to carry on and make the rest of the right. creme brulee. So if you are ready to carry on, you are going to grab that baking pan Mm -hmm. with the ramekins in it. You're going to fill them about three quarters of the way full. Yeah. Add the water, pop them in the oven. You're going to bake them for just about 40 minutes. Right. They should be set there. And with the temperature being lower, 325, you know that when you bake for even just 40 minutes, they're Mm -hmm. not going to be super solid eggs. You know what I mean? Right. It's going to be a a soft, soft custard. It's a long, slow bake. Exactly. 
Then the next step is the brulee. Because creme brulee, if you've never had it, is like a little pot of delicious cooked custard with caramelized sugar on the top. Right. So it makes like a crunchy topping for you Mm -hmm. to break your spoon through. So you're going to take the remaining four tablespoons of sugar and you're going to sprinkle the top of each of them as evenly as you can. You can go with brown sugar too instead of the white granulated. Yeah, or mix them would be good. Oh, yeah, it would. Yeah, really good. Yeah, make it your way. Then you have two choices. You can either use a kitchen torch or you can heat your broiler. I've never made this myself. I've had it in restaurants. Mm -hmm. But you love the torch. But to me, that's one thing I would buy. I wouldn't use that much. So I'd probably be using the broiler. I'm all about the broiler. I use the broiler to crisp a lot of stuff. Yeah. So it works really well. Yeah. We have the specific written out directions in the recipe on our show notes. But if you're going to do the torch, that takes just a minute or two. It takes slightly longer than the broiler. Do not leave them in too long. Trust me. Nothing under the broiler too long. No. It can happen quickly. Really quickly. Our smoke alarm from the broiler stuff has gone off so many times. <laughs> You're like, wait, I'm just cooking. Get the magazine and start fanning the smoke detector. And then once they're done, you have a choice. You can do another layer of sugar to make the brulee thicker if you want to do that. If you don't, give them a few minutes to cool down and serve them. Yep. It's creamy and delicious. And you can impress all your friends when you say, for tonight's dinner dessert, we're having creme brulee. Delicious. So try it, make it, and send us a story. We would love to give you a share. Okay. So I think it's about that time that we move into retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This week's retail therapy is the Livestock Conservancy's online shop. This is one of the ways that everyone can kind of help in supporting the Livestock Mm -hmm. Conservancy. It's fantastic because you've got everything from t-shirts and merchandise to books. I'm going to read this real quick. Your purchases from the Livestock Conservancy store and our Cafe Press store help support our conservation work. Whenever you're looking for books online, please consider going to the website store. So this is something that when you make a purchase, you can feel really good that you got something that you really wanted. And that money is going back for those conservation efforts across the board on poultry. Right. They are a nonprofit organization. Yes. In their store, there's lots of different things. Let's say there's a spot where you can get donations. Uh You can look for books. They have different categories on chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese. Books on cattle, rabbits, goats, pigs, sheep, or horses. Farming books, t-shirts, webinars and conferences, and membership packages. And then there's a little thing for sponsorship and the newsletter and the breeder's directory. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different things to pick from. And... I think they do have free shipping. So Definitely for books. Yeah, for books, you're going to get free shipping. If you're a fiber artist or a shepherd, you can also, in the online store, sign up for the Shave Them to Save Them initiative. Right. That's awesome. Which is super fun. There's lots of different books in here. The prices are not bad at all. No, no. Oh, there's a Shave Them to Save Them t-shirt. I need that t-shirt. I haven't bought it yet. What am I waiting for? <laughs> the t-shirts are cute. The women's have the V-neck, say the Livestock Conservancy on them. Fourteen ninety nine. That is not a badly not priced T-shirt, all. and your money is going to help conservation efforts of livestock in the U.S. Mm-hmm. There's children's books in here. Teach them how to do farming animals. Oh, the introduction to heritage breeds. That book, yeah, that was mm-hmm. a book that we were speaking with Ginger over at McMurray mm-hmm. last weekend about. That's going to be on there too. Home cheese making, how to build animal housing, make your small farm profitable. All different kinds of books in here that might interest you. And that's the one thing I like is buying from places like this. So it's a feel good buy for right. sure. Right. You definitely know something's good coming out of your money. Mm-hmm. So check out their website. There's a donation button there and there's also the sponsorships. Yeah. There are so many books on here you can go through. I mean, everything from basic farming to various heritage breeds to color genetics. Yeah. There's some genetics textbooks on there, which would be really, really useful if you were working on chicken breeds. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of stuff that you can go on here and get so that you feel like you're getting something back and they're getting something back. Right. And if not, you can just make a donation. Right. Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next Mm -hmm. week? Mm-hmm. Next week, we are profiling another heritage breed, the Yokohama. Our main topic is run substrate. That's one we get lots and lots of questions about. Our recipe is cheesy zucchini muffins. Yummy, yummy. And for retail therapy, we are spotlighting a rescue, the mini farmer sanctuary. Jesse's so sweet. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.